been a great day, I think. A really wide range of speakers, a uh, pretty diverse range of organizations at various stages of the maturity curve in uh, managing these types of risks. Um, I, you know, based on the relatively little, little time I've sort of observed this uh, initiative unfold, I feel like there's uh, been a, a you know, pretty significant amount of progress. Um, so obviously plenty of work to do, but uh, uh, you know, I'm pleased and encouraged at you know, seeing all the work that's, that's gone into this and how far a number of the organizations have, have taken the work that they've done. So kudos, keep up the hard work. Like I said, still lots of work to do. Um, I lead the advisory team for BSI's supply chain services and solutions business. Uh, BSI is the national standards body of the UK that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, my team and I work with uh, a variety of organizations across a variety of sectors to design, um, launch, manage, assess, improve, extend supply chain due diligence programs. So sometimes that uh, means looking at things like supply chain risk, cargo theft, terrorism in the supply chain, introduction of drugs and weapons into cargo. Uh, some of our folks are looking at business continuity risks, flood at a factory, disrupts uh, supply, a strike at a port, et cetera. My background and some other folks on my team are focused on uh, human rights due diligence in the supply chain. So, um, so this is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm hoping that the takeaway for some of you today will be to be able to leapfrog some of the, say, missteps or learnings from other industries that have been at this a bit longer. When I started in this space about 15 years ago, uh, it was mostly apparel and footwear. They were in the, uh, in the, in the, the, the crosshairs of uh, activist NGOs that were you know, calling abuses in their supply chain to light and really sort of pushed them into establishing some of these practices. Um, fast forward 15 years, and a lot of these organizations that sort of rushed into, let me go audit every single site that I've got as sort of the sole center of you know, how I'm managing this type of risk, are now trying to sort of re-engineer what they've been doing and um, find ways to use information to apply resources in a bit more of a targeted way to get a greater return on their investment, to deepen their impact, to be more efficient. So that's really what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, you know, we've sort of covered a range of topics today, but I'm going to get sort of very specific and tactical about how do we use information to effectively apply resources uh, with, with some of these programs. So let's start with well, what are the challenges to, to managing operations and supply, chain res, uh, and supply chains responsibly? And by the way, you know, I'll, I'll use the word supply chain or supplier, but know that in reality, this is designed to be interchangeable with any work site. So I think it's a little bit different in this space where, yes, we're looking at the upstream supply chain, but there's also work sites where maybe you have your own employees or there, you may have uh, subcontracted uh, workers. So know that you know, this type of approach is intended to, to um, you know, identify and mitigate risk at wherever those work sites are within your upstream supply chain or, or, or otherwise. So let's look at some of the challenges here. First off, we've got scale. You know, we've got, I think somebody mentioned before they had 3,500 suppliers, that's a lot. So how do you effectively engage suppliers at any level of depth when there's a whole lot of them? So um, you know, just that by itself makes this a really challenging lift. I've got control. I may not own the supplier sites. Uh, I may not own the sites where there's subcontracted labor. So yet I'm implicated, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm influencing it, I'm impacting it. So how do I, uh, how do I drive the appropriate behavior when I don't have 100% control over who I hire or over uh, how policies or procedures are drafted or enacted, et cetera. Next is velocity and volatility. So this may differ in different industries or for different organizations, but um, with some of your suppliers, there may be a fair amount of churn or maybe there's one-offs. So again, how do you engage suppliers? How do you assess risk of suppliers when sort of a shallow relationship by design? Um, same thing with just velocity. The businesses move faster, we're being asked to move even faster. Uh, buyers are pushing risk management professionals to, you know, I, I need information about suppliers, I need to qualify them. So how do we uh, work in an environment where there are increasing demands from a speed perspective? And then variability. So you take all these factors and then you add variability to it. So what do we, what do we mean by vari variability uh, when it comes to suppliers? So we've got I've got one guy that runs a textile mill with potential environmental risks with a small and loyal workforce. My country has average 
labor laws and weak enforcement. I speak a different language than my workforce. That leads to communication issues. I produce the end product. There's a huge increase in unskilled seasonal workers. I try to control everything, and my middle managers have few health and safety skills. I have 10,000 employees at my smallest site. I can't forecast. I never say no to my client. So therefore, my employees work 80 hours a week, even though we've got three shifts. I started my business 30 years ago. I treat my workers like a family, which is why I keep the unions out. Uh, I'm transitioning from a state-owned business. I have an aging workforce. I'm investing in new equipment and technology. I promote my products as handcrafted, uh, artisanal, one-of-a-kind work, so I work with rural economies. I just started my business six months ago. I have labor shortages. I rely on labor brokers. So just in these nine examples, very wide range of product types, size of the business, age of the business, ownership type, um, technical skills of mid and senior level managers, management styles, relationships, languages, all this stuff comes in to make up a highly uh, variable environment in just you know, a small set of suppliers. So like I said, you blow that up times 50, 100, 1,000 or more suppliers and then gets, it gets hard to not have a one size fits all approach to uh, engaging suppliers. So we'll, we'll speak a bit about that moving forward. So those are some of the challenges that uh, really organizations in most industries with complex global supply chains uh, are dealing with. Um, if we look at, you know, sort of a traditional responsible sourcing program as they started 20-ish years ago, um, you know, if, if you look at sort of any segment of suppliers, you'll have your 80-20 rule. You've got, um, and I think the, one of the gentlemen mentioned this earlier, you know, they've got their sort of key suppliers that they've been working with for years and that never changes and they're going to be working with them 10 years from now. Um, and that's this sort of 16% high risk or high impact at one end of the spectrum. We've got low risk and low impact at the other end of the spectrum. Maybe it's a one-off, maybe it's um, you know, low risk country. And then you've got lots of suppliers that might be in the middle. You know, we do some work with them, maybe they're, you know, maybe we'll work with them on a regular basis, but it's smaller lots, it, you know, it could, be, it could be a variety. But most responsible sourcing programs as typically they've been developed uh, really have been applying resources in an in a even and consistent way, despite the fact that there's this variety in types of suppliers. Um, so at one end of the spectrum, we've got wasted resources. Maybe I'm spending too much time on suppliers where the risk isn't there. The other end of the spectrum, there's lost opportunities. I've got you know, my 100 out of my 1,000 suppliers that are my key suppliers who, um, where I have the opportunity to drive change. So therefore, we've got lost opportunities to maybe strengthen skills, help them uh, understand gaps, help them be predictive, help them look at their own upstream supply chain. Um, and then we've got the folks in the middle where, you know, can we, can we just raise the bar uh, across, the, uh, across that, uh, the middle of the bell curve. So, you know, if we look at both ends of the spectrum here, um, you know, we've got my, my risk practitioner who has lots and lots of suppliers and recognizes that there's risk all over the place and oftentimes they feel the pressure to just audit everybody, because I, I want to be on the safe side. If something slips through the cracks, that's my job, that's my name on it, and I really can't take, take the chance. So essentially, they're not looking at anything as high risk. They're looking at everything as high risk. So despite the fact that you know, practitioners in the industry for years have said there's way too many wasted resources, there's way too much redundancy, you know, we're auditing the same supplier, um, I, my audit program has plateaued. I'm trying to do the same thing over and over and over again and getting the same results, uh, despite the, the lack of impact in many cases or the inefficiencies or the waste, people feel the pressure that I just need to be everywhere all the time. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got, I've got a whole lot of suppliers. I don't have a whole lot of resources. So therefore, I know I can't really engage them all, whether that's a training, an audit, a survey, but um, you know, I'm just going to sort of guesstimate as to you know who I should cover. So maybe I'll focus on this 20% over here and this other 80% I'll sort of leave out because I think that they're lower risk or lower impact. But if this is sort of an ad hoc approach or something that's not based on current relevant intelligence or done in a systematic, consistent way, it's really hard to defend decisions made by a single individual subjectively in an ad hoc way if that one thing does slip through the cracks. So at one end of the spectrum, I'm trying to do everything. The other end, I'm doing some stuff, but not really in a consistent way. So when we get to things like continuous improvement, supplier engagement, uh, you know, 
having really disciplined measurements and, and continuous improvement, being predictive, improving my return on my investment, and, and, uh, and trying to actually uh, measure that and communicate that. There's really no room for those, uh, or no time or no spend left for uh, you know, sort of that next generation approach. It just ends up being this, this treadmill of you know, continue to audit and re-audit and re-audit um, without you know, really the, the ongoing improvement. So, questions when we think about this scenario, the challenges and the constraints that we acknowledged earlier, and the sort of the model that a lot of people have inherited over the past two decades. You know, at one end of the spectrum, we can ask the question, what costs can be eliminated or reduced? The other end of the spectrum, where's their untapped value, and, and how can I engage my suppliers around strategic initiatives, whether it's region specific, whether it's uh, topic or risk area specific, whether it's product specific or process or material specific, it's, uh, it's hard to take the time to engage those folks where you really can make an impact uh, you know, if, you, if you're not allocating resources in a, in a thoughtful and, a, and a, uh, sort of a scalable way. And then for everybody in the middle of the bell curve, how can we take the standard and continue to raise that over time? So what I'll be speaking about is um, establishing models to use the right information um, to have a systematic decision-making process that is consistent across individuals within this function and across the organization, ideally, if this is baked into how people do their jobs, not just in the risk management function, but in the buying function, in the design function, as far upstream in the, in the process as possible, then we've got a lot of folks that are doing the heavy lift and are making informed decisions well before it turns into, we just found something bad at a factory. So we've got you know, plenty of examples to turn to that already speak to uh, establishing a risk-based approach around allocating program resources. We've got the UN guiding principles, speak about identifying general areas where the risk of adverse human rights impact is most significant, looking at the operating context, specific operations, product services involved, uh, or other relevant considerations, and then prioritizing based on human rights due diligence, uh, or prioritizing those for, for human rights due diligence. Again, whether it's a survey, a training, an audit, or other ways to engage your suppliers or work sites. Uh, we've got the ISO 2400 Sustainable Procurement Standard. Um, risk management should ensure that significant sustainability impacts are managed appropriately, resources applied efficiently, and decisions are taken can be justified. Again, my point earlier about being able to make a defendable decision that the entire organization has agreed upon when they designed these, uh, these models into the program. So what do we want to do? Drive improvement, reduce waste, improve program impact, um, apply the, the optimal amount and the right type of resources. Uh, it's not just, you know, who do I engage and who don't I engage, but how do I engage them? Are, am I engaging them on specific issues? Um, those are some great uh, um, examples with Morrison's, uh, or uh, with, um, uh, with Marshall's, sorry, earlier, so thanks for that. Um, and very specific and tactical with a specific type of issue with specific types of suppliers. That doesn't happen overnight, uh, and when I think about the overall industry and where the industry is in the maturity curve, you know, it will take time to build up to that point. And we start with the earlier example about, you know, build the foundation and then we've got sort of the features on top of that. Um, maintain and improve due diligence results across all operations and supplier sites. Redirect program focus with high impact suppliers from finding fault, here's, here's what's bad in an audit versus how do we drive improvements. And that involves understanding gaps in organizational systems at your, your, your supplier site. It involves developing skills at supplier sites, not just technical skills, behavioral skills. So how do we help people with critical thinking, problem solving, engaging others in the change management process? Those are things that usually aren't spoken much about when we're speaking about training and skills building in the responsible sourcing space. But um, if you can empower people and give them the thinking skills to be able to think within a dynamic, fast-moving environment at the supplier site, uh, they're more likely to make, and you've made your values clear to them, then they're more likely to make decisions that are in line with what your, what your organizational values are. So if this is what we want to accomplish, the how is develop a process or a tool to systematically and consistently assess risk and impact in order to apply the right type uh, of resources at the right time with the right type of supplier. So you know, when we work with suppliers, uh, whether it's around assessing programs, developing programs, um, developing these types of risk tools. We're looking at the external environment. So what's the operating environment in which the supplier is working? Local law, enforcement, corruption, 
history of, of incidents based on any of these risk areas I mentioned earlier. What's the exposure? So, uh, you know, what's the, the exposure to the client? What's the exposure to the supplier? Um, is it product specific? Uh, is it uh, specific to a specific type of operation? And then what controls are in place at the, uh, at, the, at the multinational level, what controls are placed at the vendor level, what controls are in place at the manufacturer level to be able to identify and acknowledge these, uh, these potential uh, areas of harm or threats and, uh, and how does the organization put that into place. And it's more than here's our policy, it's here's how it's integrated into how we make commercial decisions. So, you know, we'll go back to the, you know, the practitioner earlier where they're either at one end of the spectrum or the other. I've got a whole lot of suppliers. I either feel like I need to be everywhere all the time or I'm just going to sort of guess at where I should be. Um, so, you know, the question is how do I get my hands around so many variables? So, you know, let's look at things like influence and impact. So I've got a high degree of influence over my direct suppliers, so that's a place to start. Uh, I've got even more influence over the folks with the highest spend or the sort of the 80-20 folks. Um, there are some that deal with higher risk products, dangerous processes, dangerous materials. Maybe I want to engage them in a specific way. And there's plenty working in countries with poor enforcement of worker and environmental protections. So, you know, right off the bat, I have taken a whole lot and begun to bucket it into groups. Um, at that point, how do I engage them? I need to start understanding their controls. Is it with a survey, something I could scale? Again, addressing the issue of scalability earlier. Um, and then engaging those who represent a risk or who need more help. Again, whether that's training, whether that's assessments on site. Um, but it's not rushing out and trying to be everywhere all the time. It's making informed decisions about where can I drive change? How can I drive change? What are the issues I need to drive change on? Um, what's the nature of the relationship with the suppliers? And again, the risks that are represented by their environments or materials or process or, or history of behavior. And then, you know, we're, that's just speaking about sort of the, the, the first tier supplier. And we have plenty of very mature responsible sourcing programs that have been around, been around for quite some time that um, just still have a hard time just engaging their direct suppliers and, the, and you know, especially when they have a, a high, high volume of them. So when we think about what's at that next tier or beyond that, uh, we see some of these more mature programs that are starting to engage uh, further upstream in the supply chain. Um, you know, and you think about the UK Modern Slavery Act, it doesn't say modern slavery at your direct supplier site, it's, you know, anywhere in the product or the supply chain. And same thing in the States, um, US Customs has begun seizing cargo coming into the US uh, if it's made wholly or in part. So we've got the thread that's in the fabric, that's in the, in the clothing, Customs has the authority to seize that. That's gotten a lot of attention from, uh, from the importing community in the States. So how do we address this issue of what's further upstream? So we've got country risk, we've got product risk. Um, what about material suppliers that are highly reliant on me? That's a, uh, that's a, a case where you know, I may have the ability to drive change uh, and influence them to a greater degree. And at the other end of the spectrum, which ones are I, am I highly reliant on? So you know, if I've got a sole supplier of a key material or key product, you know, that's something that I want to have a high degree of understanding of how are they operating and what are the risks that can either harm workers on site or, uh, or present a disruption in my, own, in my own supply chain. So in this case, highly reliant on leather, I better engage this specific group of suppliers to understand and mitigate the risks. So you know, when we've worked with clients around developing these types of tools, it can be in the form of you know, mapping this out, plotting it out against higher or lower risk countries. Uh, in this case, we worked with a client that had a pretty mature responsible sourcing program, plotted out the country risk against material type and product type and part of the business, and then looked at the controls with each of those to give essentially the board of directors a high degree of visibility into where are we strong, where are we weak, and then where do we need to invest and, and focus. In this case, it was interesting because they had a whole, uh, a whole lot of um, uh, retail stores, which I normally don't associate with trafficking and slavery. Um, but they were franchisees, no controls in place contractually, their names on the front door, names on the boxes and, and the bags, products are on the shelves, and yet zero controls in place as it relates to their franchisee sites. And some of the higher risk countries, you see this row of dots across that represents the, the franchisees. So again, other tools to, um, to help people in the decision making process, uh, as well as sort of workflow tools to roll up information um, to, you know, to, to make decisions in the midst of the, 
uh, of the operation. And just final thoughts I'll reinforce, and I'm trying to move quickly. I know it's the end of the day, so I know you all appreciate that. Everybody seems awake, so that's your, that's your way of saying thank you. I've set the bar really low, you know. I come from the States, we elected a lunatic, so. As of right now, my standards are just like generally low in general. So, um, you know, there's obviously costs and opportunities in the supply chain. Uh, we need to continue to, to find ways to, to communicate that and articulate that up the chain. Don't try to boil the ocean. Uh, start basic, continue to iterate. I saw some great examples earlier of very honest examples of, hey, this is where we're at. This is where we're having challenges. This is where we want to be next year. It's not perfect, but it's better than what, than what, is, what it was last year. This is the roadmap. So I think a lot of folks in this room are in that same, uh, in that same boat, and that's great. Continue to, to, to move forward. Um, engage and work to understand impact and stakeholders, get them involved in the process. Oftentimes we forget about the worker at the center of the process, so how do we understand their voice and understand their needs as we design these types of programs. Start upstream as far in the, in the process as possible, and everything you're doing really needs to be systematic, scalable, integrated into operations um, if you want this to be credible and effective and efficient. So. Uh, happy to answer any questions during the panel. Afterwards, here's my contact info. Thanks again for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak.